Good afternoon, everyone. We're starting our committee hearing economic development on oversight for the Brooklyn Navy Yard expansions. Uh, today is Wednesday, January 23rd, 2019. I'm Councilmember Malone, and I have the privilege of chairing this committee today. I'd like to send my thanks to our fellow uh, council members here. Uh, we are joined by Council Members Rivera, Adams, and Barron. The purpose of today's hearing is to take a closer look at the expansion plans for the Brooklyn Navy Yard and to discuss its methodology, goals, and vision for the future. To kick things off, I'd just like to start by having a brief discussion of the Navy Yard itself, its history, and how it came to be the rich industrial, manufacturing, and technological hub that it is today. The Brooklyn Navy Yard is a 300-acre facility along the Brooklyn waterfront that was established in 1801 as a shipbuilding yard for the United States Navy. The yard played important roles in the American Civil War and both World Wars, and at its peak during World War II, employing over 70,000 people. In 1966, the yard was decommissioned and sold to the city, from which point it experienced significant decline until 1981, when the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation was created to manage and oversee the yard. In the years since, I have experienced several periods of economic boom in industrial and light manufacturing businesses, and the yard has become known as one of the most well-managed city facilities. Roughly 99% of the yard space has been leased for the last 10 years, and indications of strong demand for additional space prompted the expansion plans we are here to discuss today. As of September 2018, business at the Navy Yard employed 8,500 people, but the yard is also underway to have the largest expansion since World War II. Last year, the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation announced its $2.5 billion master plan, which is set to create 10,000 new jobs by 2020 and an additional 5.1 million square feet of manufacturing space, which it estim estimates will allow 30,000 people to work at the yard by 2030. The Navy Yard Development Corp has committed to continue leasing to a tenant ratio of 75% manufacturing jobs, 20% creative officers, and 5% amenities and services throughout the expanded facility. While we as a committee applaud the efforts and successes of the Navy Yard to date and the Navy Yard's master plan, we would also like to use this hearing as an opportunity to take a look at the details of that plan and gain a bit more clarity on how those $2.5 billion in city funds are being spent. Our committee and the public are eager to see what is happening today, tomorrow, and for the future. The master plan focuses around three sites for expansion within the yard all of which center around the vertical manufacturing space in which the entire supply chain is operated by manufacturers on site, from design to prototype and final production. This type of integrated facility can be incredibly appealing to small industrial and manufacturing businesses who can design, improve, and compete their products with like-minded companies in the same space and in a relatively small amount of time. If we did have one major concern regarding the yard, it is how inaccessible it remains to the general public. The yard's high walls and security fences often discourage the public from engaging with business at the site. We are curious about the Navy Yard and its result in its inclusion of the local community around the site and like to know how interested people can experience the innovation and development at the yard. Lastly, the committee is concerned with the resiliency steps currently being taken as part of the, part of the master plan to ensure that the yard can withstand rising sea levels, potential future storms, and of course, inclusion of the local community. There was nearly $5 million in damage to the yard after Superstorm Sandy, and advocates have expressed concerns that the yard's expansion might expose it to additional potential damage when faced with another major storm or rising sea levels. We are certain that the Navy Yard has responses to these questions and look forward to hearing testimony from its executive director, David Ehrenberg, today. With that being said, I'd like to thank our Economic Development Committee staff, Legislative Counsel Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Emily Forgione, and Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali for all their hard work in putting this together. Uh, they truly are the heart and soul of this committee, along with my staff, who work tirelessly each month to put this together. Now, uh, before we turn it over to, the, to David, I'd like um, the crew that's there on the first panel to raise your right hand so we can swear you in for today's testimony. So, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. All right. So, however you'd like to proceed. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And uh, that was a great uh, introduction and summary um, and a lot of very good questions, uh, many of which are covered in the presentation that I'll walk through, but there will be, I'm sure, additional questions that we can get to after the presentation. Um, I've got a 
about a 15, 20 minute presentation that will walk through additional written testimony that we'll leave behind, but that does not exactly correlate to the presentation. John, we're ready to go on the, on the video? Perfect. Great. Great. Um, first, though, um, I'm joined here by um, Harrison Green, who is our executive director for um, uh, for community outreach. Uh, Jocelyn Rainey, who's our chief administrative officer. Uh, she's got a lot of things that report to her, but including our workforce development initiatives at the yard. Um, and Claire Newman is our chief of staff, and a lot of the planning and real estate functions report through her. And David, if you can put your title on the record. And your uh, yes, sorry. And I'm uh, David Ehrenberg, uh, president of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so thank you uh, very much, uh, Chairperson Vallone and uh, members of the committee for the opportunity to um, discuss the model of the Navy Yard as well as the current phase of growth. And then we'll get to the, to the master plan and the future growth that we see coming in the, in the future decades. Um, we're going to uh, focus on, on where we are today and the kind of core principles of the model going back in time and, and today, and then get to the future. And throughout it, I hope you'll, you'll understand how our mission interweaves really with everything that we do, every decision that we make is really informed by the core of our mission. Which is um, important because it's been about four years since we've had you, and we want to take this opportunity with our new committee to work with you today and going forward. So that's why I like right. history in the background of this since there may be a few of us who are hearing it for the first time. Great, wonderful. Um, so so um, as I said, we are a mission-driven not-for-profit. Uh, we are a 501c3 LDC. And so while the city owns the property, uh, we are not technically a city agency, although we do receive city capital funding. Um, our, our mission statement is up here. Fundamentally, uh, our goal is to anchor the industrial and manufacturing sector in our area of Brooklyn and in New York more broadly, create a real estate environment where those kinds of companies can thrive um, and thus create high quality, middle class accessible jobs. And then on uh, the other side to ensure, and we go through great pains to make sure that this is true, that the local community is included in every element of those, um, of those opportunities. Um, demographically, and uh, Chairperson, you, you covered some of this in your opening remarks, but we're, we're relatively large. We're 300 acres, um, which is about half the size of Prospect Park, about a third of the size of Central Park. So we are a large physical holding. Uh, we have over 70 buildings, nearly 5 million square feet of space under roof, so in enclosed buildings. Um, and we're home to 400 businesses. And while we had about 8,500 jobs at the yard in September, our most recent count um, is about 9,000. Um, and as we'll discuss, we're, th those numbers are going up day after day. Um, this gives a little bit of the um, overview. So from the late 60s, after the federal government had closed down, almost no jobs, kind of steady increases over time, but you know a real serious lack of investment um, on the public side in terms of infrastructure and on the private side in terms of um, business creation, ramping all the way through the mid 90s, really, and into the early 2000s. Um, we now stand at a really special moment where about four years ago or so in 2015, uh, there were about 6,500 jobs at the Navy Yard. We're now at 9,000, so nearly a 50% increase in just the last three or four years. And in the next few years, 2020, maybe 2021, 2022, um, we will hit about 20,000 jobs. So doubling again and nearly tripling over that six or seven year period. That, is, uh, that growth is really driven off these five development projects, um, which total not quite a billion dollars of largely private investment, although there are some very critical public investments, including from uh, the city council, uh, local members, and the de delegation from Brooklyn that have made a lot of this possible. Um, but the vast majority of this investment is either purely private or Brooklyn Navy Yard investments, which is kind of a combination of public and private because of our- How would you break down the percentage between- um, uh, The city, pure city money is, I would say in all of this, about 100 million yeah, or so? It's 85% approximately private investment. Right. Okay, that's a large percent there. Um, so, uh, and I, mean, I should say, um, 
sometimes those in the real estate um, community can come in with a lot of beautiful renderings and you know say we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this. All of these projects are um, topped out, meaning the structure of the building is completed. Uh, they are largely enclosed, and their delivery dates are coming up in the next couple of months in most cases. So these twenty thousand jobs are going to happen. Uh, you know, what, will it be in twenty twenty? Will it be in twenty twenty one? We can't exactly know that because it's really based on the tenants. Um, but this this phase of growth is well underway and is nearly certain. Um, so why do we focus on manufacturing? Um, the reason is is really threefold. Uh, the first is that the the base pay scale um, in the industrial and manufacturing sector in New York City. These stats are for New York City. We don't have them for for the Navy Yard, unfortunately. Um, but for across it, New York City, industrial workers make about twice that which um, those worker the workers in the hospitality and retail trades do. Um, and that is a huge difference between thirty-five, forty thousand, and seventy thousand um, uh, dollars per year. Uh, but those jobs still remain accessible. That chart on the top right corner. So nearly half of the workforce in the industrial sector has nothing more than a high school diploma. Um, and so while the um, so manufacturing, while it's changing, and certainly the nature of manufacturing at the Navy Yard has changed, that legacy of manufacturing as a pathway to the middle class remains very much the case. Uh, the bottom is a little bit harder to, to see in the data, but something we see anecdotally all the time, which is that there are real meaningful career ladders in the industrial and manufacturing sector. Um, in retail and hospitality, you see a vast dom vastly dominated by very low wage jobs and then some higher paid jobs. And it, it is unfortunately often difficult to make the transition from stocking the shelves in a supermarket to owning the supermarket. It doesn't happen that often. Whereas if you look at industrial employment, it's a very even distribution of, of jobs and pay scale. And so you can go from an entry level position to a skilled entry-level position, to a management position, and on up the ranks. And so you don't have to go from a $30,000 a year job to an $80,000 a year job. There is a $40,000, $50,000, $60,000, $70,000 a job um, all the way through, which means that for the average worker, it's a lot easier to make your way up through the ladder. Have you seen that transition existing? Have you seen the latter, the growth of the entry to mid-level um, at the Brooklyn Navy? All, all the time, all the time. We see it in our data. We see it in our placements that we'll talk about through the Employment Center. And then anecdotally, you know, we all spend most of our waking hours at the Navy Yard, know most of the tenants, know a lot of the employees, and hear all the time stories of people who came in as, you know, uh, this is one of the stories, came in as a truck driver and now runs um, the highest tech laser cutter in the North East. Well, that, that's the model and the stories that we're very exactly. interested on continuing. Right. Right. Um, however, these are not your traditional, not exclusively your traditional manufacturers. The nature of manufacturing in America and certainly in a high cost city like New York is changing dramatically. Um, while we do have some traditional manufacturers, um, these tend to be at the top of their industry. So Dugal Digital Solutions is the top printing company really in the world. Um, we have producers for the city, which are artisans, woodworkers, metal workers who need to be near New York City because of our largely real estate economy here. They do museum installations, you know, residential conversions and the like. Um, the really exciting uh, group for us is the innovative manufacturers, which we see as the next generation of manufacturing in New York City, um, which are at the intersection of design, technology, and manufacturing. Uh, those can be robotics companies, um, they can be drone companies. Um, I know there's a hearing going on right now about um, e-bikes. Uh, the lift bikes were designed and prototyped in the Navy Yard. Um, and so, I'm sorry, they say lift. Jump bikes, Jump bikes sorry. Um, we also have a, a strong um, uh, center concentration in media, the arts, um, and then there is an element of creative office at the Navy Yard for reasons that we'll talk about in a second. Um, so, you know, we focus on creating a real estate environment where these companies can survive, but an eco-equal part of our mission is to then connect the local community to those jobs, and particularly because the jobs are changing, right? To run a um, high-tech laser cutter is a different kind of job and it requires different skills than you might have needed to walk onto the Navy Yard in 1942 and get a job um, during World War II. And so we really lean in to that, um, to that Change the changing realities of the workforce. 
The way we do that is twofold. The first is that we have placement services um, where we have an on-site employment center that we'll talk about that works with job seekers who are in the job market today to help them find opportunities. And then we have pathway programs, which are a diverse set of um, programs that we run for you know those in the labor, those who will be in the labor market in the coming years, um, and who we have a little bit more time to to skill for the upskill for the kinds of jobs that are coming to the yard. So in terms of the first category, um, like I said, we have uh, our on-site um, Albert uh, C. Wiltshire Employment Center. Um, here you can see the metrics that we set for ourselves and uh, were set by our funder, the Robin Hood Foundation, which is a, a tough customer when it comes to foundations. And we're proud to say that in um, every category, we outperform uh, the metrics that we set for ourselves. And this year hit an all-time high of placing 459 people into jobs at the yard. Um, that number has been growing steadily. It has been ab above 300 for the last couple of years. Um, and as you can see from, um, from these statistics, the Employment Center focuses on the hyper-local community, so the catchment um, right in the middle there. Those are the 10 zip codes that effectively abut the Navy Yard or are, are closest to the yard. And almost two-thirds of the placement comes from those zip codes. You know, we're open to any New Yorker, any Brooklynite who wants to find a job, but we spend a lot of time reaching out and making sure the local community knows that the yard and its employment opportunities are there for them. We also excuse me, um, focus on uh, NYCHA residents and those who may have experienced other barriers to employment in the past. Um, the NYCHA placements, as you can see, are about a third of the placements are from uh, NYCHA complexes generally. The majority of, are, of those are from Ingersoll, Whitman, and Farragut houses, which are um, right next to the Navy Yard. Um, and then we have a focus on uh, formerly incarcerated individuals, long-term unemployed, and um, uh, getting women into non-traditional work environments. Um, in the second category, so that's really for people who are like looking for a job tomorrow. Um, in the second category of building skills, this is um, something that I think we are all extraordinarily excited about. So in six days, if I have my days right, um, two to three, 200 and something uh, high school students will show up at the Navy Yard to move into the Brooklyn STEAM Center. This is a partnership that we developed with the D Department of Education to open a next generation career and technical education program at the Navy Yard. Uh, effectively, the model is eight local high schools will send students in their junior and senior year for half, a, half the day. So freshmen, um, uh, freshman and sophomore year and half of their junior and senior year will be spent at their home high school learning history and literature and all that. And then they'll come to the yard and study these five areas of study, design and engineering, computer technology, um, compu sorry, construction technology, computer science, uh, film and media, and culinary arts and business. And this program is deeply informed by the 400 tenants at the yard who have done everything from helping us develop the credentials that the students will gain to um, taking them as interns, doing job shadowing. Uh, they've interviewed the teachers to make sure they have industry relevant experience. Um, and we really think that when we cut the ribbon in a few weeks, it will set a new bar for this kind of education in New York City. We also run a very active internship program where we place over 150 interns per year, um, dominantly from the CUNY system, particularly um, City Tech, which is lo very local to us. Um, and importantly, we fund the vast majority of these summer, summer stipends ourselves um, to make sure that every business and every student has the opportunity to get a real meaningful internship. Uh, we also, on the business side, run a series of programs to help our businesses scale. The vast majority of our businesses are extremely small, so we run training programs, a concierge program to connect them to, um, to other resources in the community, and then connect them to each other to make sure that they're successful, because we can only add jobs, obviously, if our tenants are successful and are adding jobs themselves. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, we also want to make sure that the construction activity happening at the yard is also accessible to the local residents. And so we set what we understand to be the most aggressive MWBE and local um, hiring goals for our own construction um, in the city. Um, this is Building 77, which was a very large project, 130 something million dollars of eligible costs. 
um, and we finished this project about a year ago. These are the results. So where we set very aggressive goals, we actually exceeded every single one of those goals, um, which you know we're extraordinarily uh, proud of. Um, so that takes us through kind of what we're doing today. Uh, the master plan, you know, we're going we're gonna to hit 20,000 jobs. We're very confident in that. Um, we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that the transportation and all kinds of other things are taken care of, but we're confident that we're going to get to that 20,000 jobs. About a year ago, about a year and a half, two years ago, actually, we started asking ourselves, okay, how do we not um, rest on our laurels? How do we push forward and, and get to um, the next level of growth? However, what we realize is that we're at an interesting inflection point because really the growth of the yard to date has been driven by reusing the historic buildings that were left to us by the Navy. Um, we are now effectively out of those buildings. Um, however, we see strong ongoing demand for the kind of space we provide. And so that provides a conundrum where if we're really, our model is about adaptive reuse, and there's strong demand, demand for the space, we really are capped at the future growth in jobs unless we come up with a new plan, which is the master plan. And so what the master plan and everything that you'll see from now on as part of the master plan tried to do is set an ambitious, and I would say a very, very ambitious vision of the future for ourselves. This is a dream no small dream um, proposal that we are going to be um, pursuing. Uh, we also needed to set a, a roadmap to decide to guide decision making. So things like accessibility, um, our transportation had done had been done historically on a little bit of a catch as catch can basis. So we wanted to take a step back and ask ourselves across the board, how do we really plan this city within a city so that all elements of it, from its transportation to wayfinding, makes sense. And then, as we'll talk about, we wanted to set a, a new. Um, uh, a, a new, we want to create a new model for ground up industrial developments. And the city, that, the kinds of buildings that you're going to see in the, in, in the later slides are buildings that really have not been built in urban America ever, frankly. And a mantra we kept saying is if not at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, then where? We want to set the bar extraordinarily high for ourselves. So, like we said, we'll be at 20,000 jobs in the coming years. And we asked ourselves, how do we add another 10,000 jobs to get ourselves to a total of 30,000? Um, as you said in your opening remarks, we want that concentrated in manufacturing um, sectors. So we envision about three quarters of the jobs to be in the industrial and manufacturing areas. Um, but with a mix of creative office and amenities and services, the creative office add to the ecosystem of the yard. They also pay higher rents than manufacturers can afford, and so help to cross subsidize the manufacturers um, and amenities. You know, you got to feed people if they're they're working. And so that would take us to 30,000 jobs with, a, with approximately this, this mix, again, right around 75% manufacturing. In order to hit that 10,000 additional jobs, we would need to add about 5 million square feet of additional space. So like I said, this is a dream no small dream plan. This is one of the sites, I'm sorry, I'll go back. Those are um, concentrated on these three sites that you can see here. Um, one effectively on our border with Dumbo, one on our border with Clinton Hill and Fort Greene, and one on our border with, um, uh, with Williamsburg. The fact that all of those sites were at the edge of the yard provided a fantastic opportunity um, for us, we believe, to um, open up the gates a little bit and make the edge of the yard a little bit more porous to the community. And so what you see here by way of example is on the Williamsburg side, large large buildings uh, dominated on the, on the lower floors in blue here by manufacturing spaces. The lowest floors would be large scale manufacturing spaces with high ceilings for when these companies go to scale. Up the building, you'd have smaller unit sizes. And then at the top, you have the office towers um, where the design and prototyping might happen, um, and that also provide a critical cross-subsidy to allow the economics of this to work. On the ground floor, what you see is a, a walkway around this barge basin, which is a body of water at the Navy Yard that currently is inaccessible to the public. The general public would be able to walk right in, walk around that barge basin, and on the ground floor of those buildings, on this site, what we're envisioning is um, showrooms. So something that would engage the community, invite them in, but have something really meaningful to do with what we're doing at the yard, so where our woodworkers and manufacturers could actually sell their products on site and, and the general public could see what's happening. So how do you plan to, to do that? I think just while you're doing the presentation, I think a big part of that for us is the inclusion 
of these wonderful visions to make sure that the waterfront is accessible, the community is involved, that vision is also represented. So the steps that you're going to include, how is that going to happen? Yeah, so um, so we, in developing this master plan, we have been running a pretty inclusive process, I would say, where we're meeting with tenants, we're meeting with local stakeholders, um, members of the uh, our local elected official delegation, um, and really kind of iterating this plan over time. Um, in terms of the execution of this, you know, that will be our next big challenge. And these are not cheap buildings to build. And the economics are of, of um, uh, building for manufacturing tenants are, are they're challenging because the, we have to charge an affordable rent for these manufacturers or, or else they can't operate their business. Um, we have a proven track record right, where we've added millions of square feet of space in just the last couple of years, and we've figured out how to make the economics work. And our, um, you know, that's that's our collective work to do in the coming years. But we certainly have a large set of of tools that we can use. We are one of, if not the most active user of tax credits. In, in the economic development world, not affordable housing, but in economic development in the country. Um, we would continue to do that. We're an opportunity zone, um, which is still a little uncertain exactly how that program is gonna take shape, but that is a potentially uh, another uh, important uh, tool we'll have to make the economics of this pencil out. And then importantly, I would note on the ground floor to answer one of your questions, um, the ground floor is envisioned, the lowest floor is envisioned as a parking facility for the workers in this space that gets the building out of the floodplain critically. Um, this is you know, a, a rendering of what that area could look like. So what you see here again are on um, the lower floors, the, the public facing uses. Up right above, you see those high, high ceiling height floors where you'd have large scale manufacturing, then above smaller scale manufacturing um, and office uses. This is the Dumbo um, uh, development site, um, which really mimics the same concept, where a ground floor plane is open to the public. The, gen the um, local residents could walk right in through that kind of yellow greenish area. Um, the red area on the ground floor is a public facing um, facility. Here we're envisioning an engineering museum, uh, small, but something that is would be an amenity to the, to the community. There are a couple of public schools right here as well as a boys and girls club. Um, and also speak to what we're doing um, at the yard, which is a lot around you know, modern manufacturing and engineering. Um, and you know this is this is the rendering of that site, and then lastly on Flushing Avenue, really um, abutting um, Clinton Hill, um, we are envisioning the same basic concept with a ground floor program here centered around food manufacturing, um, which is the building just to the left here is our building 77, which we just completed and have an active. Um, ground floor program of food manufacturing and retail, again, to enliven that ground floor, but still have a use that is meaningful to what our mission is about and that creates large numbers of jobs. Um, and here is the rendering of that site. Um, so that was a lot. Um, I'm happy to take questions um, and, and dive deeper into any of the points um, that came up or that you, uh, others that you have. Well, clearly we need more than one hearing. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot going on and there's a lot of good stories there. But what I'd like to do is, is start off the questioning uh, with the council member who pretty much hosts most of the area there, and that's Council Member Steve Levin. So. Thank you very much, Chair Ballon. I, I just have a, a quick statement, just that um, I, and we've had a relationship in my, um, in my nine years in the council um, with the Navy Yard, and you have had that relationship with not only the elected officials that represent the Navy Yard itself, but all of the surrounding areas. Um, and, you know, by and large, um, the Navy Yard is a great success story of the last uh, 20 years uh, in New York City, where uh, you have really been able to uh, transform uh, and reimagine um, uh, industrial and light industrial uses um, to be uh, to go against uh, the trends and go against the grain in New York City, where um, we've seen um, a lot of industrial uses flee the city. By and large, you've brought them in or been able to maintain them. Um, uh, and, and so I think, uh, you know, we look forward to kind of working through this strategic master plan um, uh, and kind of how um, we can set the Navy Yard up for the next 50 years. 
Um, and, you know, one of the benefits that the Navy Yard has is, um, you know, a, a, an abundance of, uh, of, of zoning uh, to work with or floor area to work with. Um, and, uh, and, a, and a strategic vision, um, which has been on track for a long time. So, um, you know, I guess my one question is kind of what, what do you see as the biggest challenges um, you know, over the next decade or so, or things that in, uh, could potentially impede uh, your growth or your expansion, um, whether that's a, you know, big picture uh, macroeconomic issues or, um, you know, small, uh, small picture kind of regulatory, city regulatory issues. Um, how, how are you approaching that issue and what have you seen on the horizon? Yeah, um, and and I'll say I'm going to leave most of the answering of questions to the team here. Who actually, does most of the work. Um, I'll I'll take this one and then hand it off to them because I suspect that they see other challenges. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have noted in the presentation, the master plan uh, will require a ULERP. Um, it uh, we are have not certified yet. We're hoping to do so in the spring to around the spring. Um, it is important to note in any ULERP, this ULERP will not request any additional floor area or density. Uh, we do have an abundance of that, but there are elements of the current zoning um, program in M zones that just don't quite fit with the current needs of manufacturers, particularly around um, parking and, and loading. And so the kinds of buildings you see here are simply impossible to build under current zoning. Um, I, I would say two, two challenges that we really think about. One is resilience, right? We are 300 acres on the waterfront and we'd be not doing our job if we weren't taking that extraordinarily seriously. We talked about that for new buildings, which is um, expensive and complicated, but relatively straightforward. You just lift them out of the floodplain and you know put parking below. And so we will certainly do that. We have 70 historic buildings, some of which are, you know, go back to nearly the founding of our country. Um, to lift them is not possible. Um, and so we are working through the master plan and with a small, uh, with a, with a, another group of consultants to come up with a a plan to um, to make ourselves as resilient as possible. We cannot dry proof our historic buildings. It is physically impossible. We are also built in no small part on quicksand and certainly on a lot of fill and, and what was formerly marsh. And so we will get wet in the next storm. And so it's incumbent upon us to figure out a, what the way we think about it is a, a set of tools for our tenants where we can address their core business needs. Um, in the case of, of a flood, and so while the building might get wet, how do we protect that $500,000 laser cutter, right? Where the metal that goes in the laser cutter, that can get wet, that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and you can move your computers and movable equipment, that laser cutter is not going anywhere. It's, you know, quarter the size of this room. And so how do we dry proof that laser cutter? And something that we are thinking very right. carefully about. And just to be, you know, just to be clear here, the, um, the amount of damage caused by Sandy at the Navy Yard between uh, the Navy Yard and your tenants was probably about a half a billion dollars? Or um, no, no. I mean, it was not quite that much. It was about a hundred million dollars, okay. pretty evenly split between us and our tenants. Okay. Our tenants have, um, made themselves more resilient. A lot of that was the on-site power plant that um, absorbed a lot of that, um, which feeds the, the Con Ed grid. Um, but a lot of our tenants have taken steps. Frankly, I think a lot of our tenants were also, as a lot of people in New York City, were caught off guard and so mm -hmm. did not move their product as mm -hmm. I think they will next time. Um, so we think a lot of those costs will be avoided. Um, we sustained about $50 million of damages ourselves. We're in the um, kind of early stages of actual construction and i.e. kind of late stages with FEMA of getting funding to um, to elevate all of our substations. We, we operate a microgrid, so we own all the substations and um, uh, within the yard. And so those are all going above the above the floodplain. But um, six years later, you're still working with FEMA and, S and SBA or your tenants are still working with, with SBA to to, to, to access funds that are through We are certainly of still working with FEMA. Yeah, yeah. and Claire can talk more yeah. about that. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, you know, this is a, a decade-long process. process. It's a long process, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and the other challenge that I think a lot about is the changing nature of the skills that are required in these businesses. Mm -hmm. And that um, 
is so core to our mission, right, that we take it extraordinarily seriously and spend an enormous amount of time thinking about that. The STEAM Center um, is the centerpiece of that. I would say we are, whole, that's a 30,000 square foot facility, which we built on behalf of the city. So we, we did the design and construction of that space um, instead of school construction authority. Um, we are reserving the other half of that floor, so another 30,000 square feet, in the hopes of either expanding that program or getting a CUNY program to operate um, in that space as well. So we are um, focused on what we're doing now and opening a high school and certainly a next generation new um, new program is, you know, it's a lot to, to uh, bite off right now, but we are certainly focused on what the next set of initiatives will will um, focus on for to address this skills the skills requirements for these next generation of manufacturers what would you guys say in terms of other challenges so David you hit upon exactly what I was going to um, talk about with all of this growth I mean we're going from you know 9,000 jobs to 20,000 jobs like right now and then thinking about us going to 30,000 jobs how are we going to continue to keep the community connected to these jobs is something that I lose sleep over every day, right? Because the majority of the businesses that are going to be coming on board are still going to be small manufacturers. And, you know, one of the issues is that small manufacturers feel like the talent isn't here in New York City. And I think that we've done a lot of work towards um, getting past that barrier with our tenants. But as we bring on new tenants, how are we going to continue to do that? And so I think that being creative around, I think the STEAM Center is one answer because degrees are not the barrier, it's really skills. Um, but I also think we're going to have to think a little bit about apprenticeships and, you know, really how are we going to get the community involved in those kinds of programs and continuing our internship programs as well. So um, I think that's something that we're really going to have to push hard on is really thinking about how do we make sure that the surrounding community is trained for these jobs that we're going to have here as well. Thank you so much. And Chair, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to, to sit in on your committee. Absolutely. It's your community. <laughs> so we've also been joined by Council Members Cornegie, Menchaca, Lander, Rosenthal, and uh, Levine. Got to work on that handwriting. And Powers. And Powers. Keith is coming, too. So there's, there's a lot here, and, and, and most of it's all good news. I can't see how it couldn't be. Um, it's just like a matter of bringing it all out, how you got to this point, and how we can tackle. I believe this, this will be an annual hearing, because there's, there's a duty to bring this information, uh, even beyond the local. We're talking about all 8.2 million people in New York City need to know the opportunities. The students need to know the opportunities, um, because this is the success story we try to build and grow in so that folks realize you don't need to go anywhere. We, we have it right here. Um, so I, I kind of broke it up, and I'll, I, the council members have questions, but I, the areas that I see are ones that you've touched, so we can probably delve a little bit more. But workforce development, the community engagement, we didn't touch too much about transportation, but as we're growing the amount of employees, employers, obviously there's going to be a greater stress and demand on the transportation infrastructure. Uh, I mean, we could talk about that. The resiliency plan of it, zoning, since you mentioned the ULR, um, what you actually are zoned for and what type of zoning you would need. Um, and then I think the reporting area would be exactly this, similar to what we've done now with working with uh, President Patchett and the EDC, uh, a lot of the Concerns is the ability for us as a city council to be, have the recording, have the accountability of corporations and non-for-profits working right within the city and us having some ability to have a say in that. So I think today is the opportunity to learn a little bit there. So as this was handed over or created with the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, and BNYDC, was EDC there first? Was economic development then handed? Or did you just meet, take over from that one point? Um, yeah, so the history is um, the, um, at you know, 1969 when the city uh, purchased the property, uh, they tried, they, they, and I don't know, it was probably a predecessor of EDC, I don't know who it was, um, got a private shipbuilder to operate in the yard for a few years. They then went out of business. They then tried to find a car manufacturing plant to locate at the Navy Yard. That didn't go anywhere. Um, they then leased it to a predecessor not-for-profit um, called Click. Um, which was then dissolved and reformulated as the Navy, as BNYDC in 1981. And so it's always, it's, it's never been EDC, it's been, it's been the Navy Yard. 
uh, a lot of our city capital funding and um, relationship with the city actually runs through SBS because we're on the waterfront. So why don't we delve a little into that? So uh, the relationship with SBS and the amount of city capital funding, what is the percentage there? Um, sure. So do you, do you want to take that? Sure. sure. So our structure with SBS is primarily governed by two documents. We have a ground lease, uh, which runs for a term of 99 years and passes through a lot of the requirements and responsibilities that the city wants to see the Navy Yard deliver on. And then we also have a master contract with the city that runs through SBS, which governs a lot of the flow of funds around city capital dollars. Um, I would describe the capital money that supports the Navy Yard in two buckets. Uh, first is what we would call is a 10-year state of good repair plan which is something um, the Navy Yard and OMB and City Hall agreed to some years ago and essentially uh, wrote the roadmap for how the Navy Yard would get its streets, its roofs, the basic infrastructure back into a state of good repair because uh, it's wonderful to have a 300-acre asset, but we also have the responsibility for all of those utilities and streets. When did streets. that start? When did that 10 year? It started about 10 years ago. <laughs> so I oh, get, up. yeah, it's exactly. Right it's more like a 20 year at this point. Uh, funds roll, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that was approximately $200 million. And we're working our way through that list of repairs every year. Um, and then in the second bucket are funds that are given to the Navy Yard. So with that first bucket and those repairs, mm -hmm. where is the recording going to? Is it OMB? Is it Yes, it's to OMB. Um, and then all of the contracts follow the standard kind of city capital process where we get a certificate to proceed from OMB and then those contracts are registered by the controller's office. So would we now need to revisit and look for expansion within that project of what a different infrastructure needs that you would need and the community would need? We do that uh, on a fairly regular basis with OMB um, through their yearly capital process, but um, you know, certainly something we are always open to and excited about because as we, <laughs> as we continue to operate the yard, the reality is this facade needs a replacement or that roof needs a replacement, um, and we're catching up on effectively 50 years of deferred maintenance. Um, from the period of the 60s when the, when the Navy left and the recent history when money started to flow for basic infrastructure. Does that include the capital costs of the old historic buildings and the new vision buildings and yeah, the plan that you're laying out? Not all of that. So with respect to the basic repairs on the old buildings, yes. Um, if a building needs its roof replaced or needs a new electrical system, indeed. Um, for the new master plan, there's no funds allocated yet. Um, and then the second bucket of money is for specific projects. So for Building 77, for example, which David talked about in his presentation, that was about a $195 million project. And the city, and uh, thanks to the support from a number of council members and the borough president, provided around $100 million. And is that within the same timeline, a 10-year? That's complete and open. But it was in, within that same 10-year plan, but it was above and beyond the kind of set amount of money that OMB had already agreed to. That was the kind of um, project where we had to go and explain the job creation. It was a new project, and we asked for support. So how does the interagency, I guess, coordination work then? That's a big thing with all of our committees, mm -hmm. is the fact that you are not just operating alone. You're with all the city agencies at this point, from buildings and zoning and Europe and NYCHA and housing and jobs. Um, how is that handled within the interagency cooperation? Um, so a, um, a lot of it runs through SBS, as Claire said, and, and the controller's office. And that's just, you know, frankly, a, a process we have to get through. And um, uh, we do that every year. Our contract this year is actually a multi-year contract to kind of smooth it out for us and make it a little less um, uh, paperwork intensive each year. Um, in terms of the other agency coordination, you know, Department of Buildings S um, reviews some of our building plans. SBS, again, because we're on the waterfront, reviews other building plans. Um, and we just, you know, we've got relationships there and we're, we largely there act as a builder, as a private developer. And those are um, uh, less sister agencies in that case and more regulatory agencies making sure that our buildings are, are you know, up to code and, and safe. Um, so what percentage of the buildings then would you be the owner operator versus the leased or sold off to private? Um, there are really only three developments that are not our own. Steiner Studios, which is relatively large and encompasses a corner of the yard, that's ground leased. 
Um, there's another, um, what's called Dock 72, which is a 700,000 square foot new development, which is going up, which is ground lease to uh, Boston Properties and Rudin, a joint venture between the two of them. And then on the other corner, the um, Admiral's Row, which is going to be the site of a supermarket and other retail. We ground leased that as well because we're not a retail developer and didn't, didn't want to get into that line of business. We had made a commitment to the community long ago to bring a supermarket, and so we're going to honor that commitment, but we didn't actually want to be the landlord of a supermarket. We just we just don't do that. So we, um, as a general matter and in the master plan, expect excuse me, to build, own, and operate our, our buildings ourselves. It gives us complete control over the tenanting, tenanting decisions, and that's hundred, you know, that's everything for us. If we can't control the tenant decisions, we don't know whether it's going to be just another pure tech company or whether it's going to be the kinds of companies we attract, which create a wide diversity of jobs. And so, the control within the company, within the not-for-profit, is essential. Um, every single leasing decision, um, I see personally, and look at how many jobs. Look at whether you know if they're existing tenant have they used the employment center and to what effect. Um, I meet with most of them. It is a decision that we take extraordinarily seriously, because we don't create the jobs; it's the tenants that do. Um, so uh, well, I think it's kind of both. Since you're, you're yeah, saying yes, it, yes, it, but we can't. We alone can't do it. Right. Absolutely. So we alone can't do it. So um, so uh, we only do public-private partnerships where it's a kind of project which we really can't do. Retail development, an office development, Steiner Studios, we don't want to run a, a film studio that's not really within our core competency. Other than that, we try to self-develop. So um, how much, I guess, of the new plan versus what you have existing would be a new type of business versus continuing the businesses that you already have? Um, so, so the vision is um, of, in the master plan, in those three sites, that we will build, own, and operate all of those sites. Now that is the current vision. There is a high probability that we will decide to do one or more public-private partnerships in, in that, but only in the right conditions and only where we believe that it's um, uh, effective for our mission to do so. Um, and that is a decision that frankly we just, we can't make now. We have to make at the time when, the, when those opportunities are, um, uh, present themselves to us. Um, I, I want to clarify one thing about the master plan. So the master plan calls for about two and a half billion dollars of additional investment. That is no small number. Um, and you know, another concern I have is figuring out the capital stack to make those work because we charge our tenants, um, you know, a, a fraction of what the private real estate market would charge. And so making the economics of building that building, getting enough debt into those buildings to make it to make it pencil out is is a challenge. We have taken the position that we can and will execute on that master plan ourselves with the tools that are out there right now. So the opportunity zone program, tax credits and the like, because we are, you know, we've got um, cash flow that we can reinvest into the Navy Yard and at the right time, we will re reinvest that into one of these buildings. So we have not made an explicit capital ask to the city council or to the administration or to the borough president or anybody else related to that master plan. When the time comes and when we've designed a building and when we perhaps have an anchor tenant who that we're ready to build for, at that point, there will be a conversation to be had. And we certainly don't want to preclude that because the master plan and its eight buildings can go at one pace if we build it and have to finance it entirely ourselves. And it would go at a very different pace and a much accelerated pace if we have the kind of public support that we've enjoyed in the past. It sounds like our ongoing dilemma, depending on who's doing the building and who's got control of the project, whether we're dealing with libraries, schools, parks, you know, right. ELF, EDC, there's always a different set of rules. So right. how does that all, and forgive my trying to tie this all in, and this will be my last question on this and we'll turn it over. Is, how does that relate to the relationship with SBS and OMB and the decisions that you just outlined that you're going to make? So in the contract that's there and the underlying lease, where is the coordination between what is developed? Is it all through the nonprofit or is there that city engagement? Um, I, I would say that there is a, a lot of city engagement. Um, we work very closely with uh, the deputy mayor, deputy mayor Glenn's team, 
Um, it is important, and we're joined here by Hank Gutman, our board chair, that we also have a highly professionalized uh, board um, representing um, uh, real estate professionals, um, workforce development professionals, lo the local community, um, and it is a very active and engaged board. Um, and so the um, decision-making process, it, it, while highly coordinated with the city and our sister agencies, is formally run through and, and substantively in many ways run through the, bo the board process. Um, not many ways, in, in all ways. And, and how many board members do you have? Uh, we have a, a large board. Um, we have 28 um, board members. Um, and it's a large board because you know we need all the real estate professionals, we need finance professionals, we need community members, we need a lot of different. Um, our four local council people um, have. I'm sorry, three local council people and the borough president have have um, delegates on the board, and so it's a okay. it's a uh, very healthy but um, diverse set of people. See, and the president of the board didn't think he was going to be part of the series. Right. <laughs> Told you we were going to get you involved. All right, so what, I, what I'd like to do, I, I, I want to go into the, uh, the educational, I think the opportunities there with the STEAM Center and the students is, is screaming for uh, and delving into and how we can expand that. But I'd like to turn over to the council members to sign up for questions. So first is Council Member Inez Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. And I'm very familiar with the Navy Yard because I lived uh, my childhood up to about age 16 in the what was then called the Fort Greene projects. They've mm -hmm. since been separated into two uh, NYCHA developments. The um, Steiner Studios, is there a, rela a relationship between your company, your corporation, and Steiner Studios? And if so, what is that relationship? And I'm interested in that because I am the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. Okay, yeah. ah, right. Um, so our relationship with Steiner Studios is uh, one of a ground lease transaction. And so uh, Steiner Studios, I believe, was opened in 2001, mm -hmm. oh no, 2004. Um, and their whole development site and their expansion plan is governed by a ground lease between the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation and their operating entity. Um, and so that lease governs the nature of the relationship. I would say that Steiner Studios is, through that relationship, responsible for doing all their own construction, getting all the approvals they need for whatever they want to build. Um, they go out and secure their own financing, and then they make the decisions around what movie productions come into the facility. Um, I think members of the com committee probably know that Firestein uh, Graduate School of F Film is there, which is right. a CUNY program, uh, and that was put into one of the buildings there with city support. So what is the financial relationship between the two or the two entities? Uh, they pay us a ground rent each they year. They pay you a ground rent. Do you know what that amount is? Part of it is participation, uh, so it can vary a little bit from year to year. I don't have the figure at the top of my head. Okay, if I could get that at some point uh, sure. subsequently, that would be great. The other pro question that I have which was alluded to by the chair, talks about education. So if you could talk a little about the high school and about what appears to be another program, another component that's not actually the high school. Are there two distinct programs? Because I heard you say that there are five schools that will be sending students. Yeah, sure. Do you want to um, explain it a little bit? Um, so um, about five years ago when David came on board, one of the things that we um, really pondered was how are we going to close this um, gap between um, a, finding a workforce and, and the, that our businesses need and this, this idea that the skills don't exist here in New York City. And we were really trying to think about how do we create this training program or give um, someone who actually does that work space so they can create a training program that might be something like a last mile training for college students in order to ensure that they're able to get the jobs that are um, on the yard. Um, with that, we had a, it took us a while uh, uh, trying to have conversations with CUNY and um, different entities around how do we create this. And at one point, I don't know if you know Dr. Lester Young, he is a regent. Very well, yeah, I've known so. him for about 45 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, so Dr. Lester Young came to the office one day, had asked for a meeting with us, um, came to the office and said, listen, I'm thinking about this program that would look like what a BOCES program is upstate and in Long Island, where the students go to the program every day and just can just 
focus on those career and technical skills. And we were like, oh my God, that's exactly what we're trying to think. We weren't thinking about high school students, but that's even better. Um, we were thinking about college students. We, we were all in. So with that, um, the DOE um, signed on and said that this also sounds like a great program as well. And the DOE um, took on this new vision around um, career and technical training of having what we thought of at the time as a hub where students from eight local schools could come to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is a place where we know business is happening, and that they could just focus on these skills. We thought this is a great opportunity for us to make sure that our businesses could inform the program, that they would be um, guest lecturers, that they would help to create the curriculum, so that, you know, I have this saying that, you know, people support what they help to create, so that when they know that they've been part of this program, that they were actually going to hire the folks that they help to train. Um, so it has expanded since then that it's now it's going to be its own high school, but it's still going to be fed by these eight schools. So they're going to have home schools where they go to high school in Brooklyn, very local to where we are. And they are, um, when they're junior and senior year, they're going to start coming to the STEAM Center, which is going to be located in Building 77, which is the million square foot building that we just opened, where we're going to have um, some of our most um, prestigious um, manufacturers um, in that building, so that we're thinking about the students actually being on the elevator with these building with these. So um, it's going to it's going to be a high school. It's opening. It's 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 a high school that's going to be fed by four by eight separate high schools. And when will it actually be functioning? Um, six days from now. Okay, so you're going to begin it in this fall, in the spring semester. So the school has also, they have seniors already. So they're going to start coming to the site here at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So they've had satellite space at um, Boys and Girls High School, at um, Westinghouse High School, and, um, and Wingate High School. I'm sorry, Wingate High School. How many students will be a part of this school? Um, 200, approximately close to 200 students. Uh, that'll be the juniors and the seniors that will be coming to the program at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And how were the schools selected? So they were selected looking, as so they were thinking about um, schools that had higher performing sco scores and lower performing scores. Um, so the, the schools that were selected were selected by the DOE. We didn't select the schools. Um, and they were selected based on like proximity to the Navy Yard. So George Westinghouse, um, Benjamin Banneker, Bedford Academy, um, High School for Global Citizenship, Science Skills, Science Technology, Boys and Girls, and Mega Evers College Prep are the schools that will be involved. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I have more questions, but it'll be round two. Yes, we'll definitely. Okay. I, I know there's two o'clock hearings you. coming up, so I just want to give an opportunity for quickly some questions for both. So, Helen, if you, uh, I think you're next, right? Adrian. Adrian's next. Okay, Adrian and Helen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for your testimony today. This is very encouraging uh, to hear about the project and just hear the magnitude and the scale of this project. So thank you for your hard work. Um, I'm getting to the party a little bit late, so I'm just going to ask a couple questions briefly just to give myself a little more of the backstory. Uh, as far as community engagement is concerned, um, my uh, colleague uh, Carlina Rivera was here earlier, and she kind of whispered something to me. She said that uh, her grandmother lived in Farragut Housing, and um, she said, I really hope that they do well um, for those residents and tenants over there at Farragut. So can you let her know what it is that you have intentionally done for the residents in Farragut? Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I'm going to turn this over to Harrison because he actually does a lot of this work. It's something that we take extremely seriously um, and have really invested a, a, a lot of time and energy in, um, in in recent years. So Harrison, do you want to kind of describe a, a day in the life and then I'll, I may jump back in? Sure. Um, so I, our, our reach to the community sort of knows no bounds. Uh, we, we do a lot of investment in time, not only in the workforce area, but also sort of in the uh, sponsorships and philanthropic area. So we recognize that, again, there's sort of a, a gap, not just with trying to get into the workforce, but but also just sort of in the day-to-day -day living, right? So we do a lot of sponsorships, particularly around, uh, like, this this uh, Thanksgiving, we, we helped uh, – with our uh, the uh, food pantry, which we do monthly, actually, uh, uh, that's uh, hosted with in conjunction with MARP and City Harvest, um, we do uh, over 500 toys uh, for the the holiday season um, as well. Um, 
and beyond that, uh, during the any given month, um, we're engaging with uh, tenant with the tenant associations probably about six times uh, through tenant association meetings as well as uh, individual programmatic meetings. Um, in addition to that, we're out and dealing with the community boards as well and hearing and touching base with our community organizations. Each year, we do, well, twice a year, actually, we do uh, engage our community organizations, uh, bring them all together and sort of do sort of a presentation similar uh, to, to what we've done here to make sure that they're all abreast and, and, and keep aware of what's going on and opportunities at the yard. And I would just, um, so just to, to provide a, a very current example of this um, and, and, and how seriously we take this. Because look, we, do, we do know that the Navy Yard is surrounded by, by walls, and until recently, those walls had, had barbed wire on it and signs saying, government property, keep out. So there's a long legacy here of, um, you know, of a kind of arm's length relationship. And it's something I, I got my start as a community organizer in Brooklyn, and so I know the importance of just being present. And I think that um, for us to be present, we got to get outside the, the walls. And I'm not sure that we've always historically done that, something that we took we take very seriously now. Um, we have the grocery store opening in um, the fall of this year. They've already started hiring. As part of that deal, um, we negotiated for a three-week sole source hiring period where they could only take um, resumes from our employment center. Uh, that period was um, during December. It was actually extended to a, to a three-week period. And in that period, our team held um, more than 60 um, programs out in the, in the community, either informational sessions, training sessions, and, uh, and application sessions. Um, and over the course of, of three weeks, it was, you know, multiple times a day, uh, we did it both at our employment center, um, at the um, community center at, no, I'm just blanking, was it Farragut or Ingersoll? Ingersoll. At Ingersoll um, and at the Boys and Girls Club, which serves um, largely those um, three complexes. Um, and we had extraordinary turnout. We, we hired nine local residents to actually go door to door and kind of put flyers under, <laughs> under, under doors and the like, although we didn't do that because I don't think you're allowed in NYCHA, but something like that. Um, and really kind of uh, made an, an enormous investment. I had a conversation with Hank saying, I think we might be overdoing this and spending more than we need to, but it was something that we wanted to err on the side of way overdoing rather than slightly underdoing. Um, and, you know, the results um, speak for themselves. And this is, you know, largely Harrison and um, our executive director for, I'm sorry, vice president for course development, a woman named um, Katie. Uh, their effort uh, resulted in 741, 40, 42, 742 applicants um, going in and getting a, a head start on that, on that process. It's great to hear. Thank you. Um, I have a background in community board. I've been community board chair for a number of years in Queens, so that's really important to me. My two final questions, again, have to do with the community. Um, out of your 28 board members, how many come from the community? And my final question would be, uh, your 9,000 jobs, uh, what is the percentage of uh, workers that are coming from the community proper? Um, so the latter question, I have the statistic uh, right here, precisely. So um, for the yard-wide employ employment, 53% um, are uh, Brooklyn residents, and about 30% are from our 10 most local zip codes. I will note that that's, if anything, those are, are low, because we're taking that off driver's licenses, and there are some people who apparently work at the Navy Yard who like, live in California, which clearly is just they haven't changed their driver's license. So that, then those numbers are probably actually a little bit higher. Um, and like I said, we do the employment center, the placements we make through there are higher in the local community because that's where we do most of our outreach. Um, in terms of our board members, Claire and I could probably huddle and try to figure it out, but I would say the majority um, live in the immediately surrounding zip codes. Um, and we have a number who, um, so, so they're part of the community, and then we have a number who, you know, uh, work for community organizations or are somehow kind of officially tied to the community other than just being residents. Yeah, stakeholders. Very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Helen Rosenthal. And we've been joined by Peter Koo. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. It's really impressive. I have a couple of questions about uh, 
that have to do with slides in the presentation, mm -hmm. so I might ask you to open sure. it up. But if we could start just very quickly, and this was a question that um, Councilmember Cornegy asked me to ask, is uh, the consultant that you hired for this project, was it a MWBE? Um, for, for the master plan? Mm -hmm. um, is it WXY? Um, uh, yes, they are. I believe they're a W. I don't know if they're a registered W um, woman-owned business, but yes, one yes, of the principles is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great to hear. Um, and then for the uh, the jobs that you were just mentioning, where you did a tremendous amount of outreach and got 741 applicants, local applicants, that was for how many jobs? Uh, it's for um, about 500 jobs um, and. Um, Th those the interview process is now ongoing. Okay, could you get back to us when the jobs are filled with what number ended up getting jobs? Yes, of course. Great, that'd be great. Um, and then if you look at, and tell me this is like really quick and dirty mm -hmm. on the envelope math that no one should ever do, but <laughs> <No problem. laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> So a billion dollar of investments end up getting 20,000 jobs. Is that a fair statement, just looking at your testimony? Um, so, uh, so the current phase of development um, is just under um, is just under a billion dollars and will generate about 14,000 jobs because I was just doing quick and dirty math. Yeah. Let's call it four, call yeah. it 20,000. Right. Take it. Right. That gets us to $50,000 per job. Right. Okay. And then over time, will the number of jobs grow so that these, this billion dollar investment is sort of serves as a fixed cost so that the cost per job over time would um, come down? Or? Jobs are certainly densifying um, it, within the yard. And so, you know, companies are packing more and more people into smaller spaces, so I would imagine that it will go up some. But I think it is very important to note, and this may not be the point of your question, but that billion dollars, the vast, vast, vast majority, 85% of it is private investment, so not, not public investment. So um, you know, that is just the cost of construction of, I would, of new buildings. I would have thought you would have said which would have been interesting to me, that the vast majority of it is to shore up the ground so that you don't have problems with, um, you know, flooding again, uh, something like that. So, yeah, so part, so part of it is the infrastructure investment, which has been, um, we've partnered with the city to make sure that, that we address those issues. But of that billion dollars, the vast majority is just the cost of, um, on our side, adaptively, adaptively reusing um, yeah. uh, old buildings and just you know yeah. gutting them, building 77, a million square foot building, which is on the corner of Flushing and um, Vanderbilt, so a very right. visible corner for the Navy Yard, had had no windows on the bottom 11 floors. Right. So we spent $200 million, just under $200 million, uh, modernizing every element of that building, adding windows, all new elevators, all new systems. And each one of these developments that you see here comes along with a you know pretty hefty construction Got price. It. So is that billion dollars, that's a fixed cost? That's a one-time fix? That's right. So hypothetically, next year, when we don't have that cost, right, that investment has already been made, right? Exactly, yes. Okay, got it. Could you go to the slide which um, had the picture of the buildings the first one with the walkway that was in yellow. Yes. <laughs> Although, oh, it's up there. Okay. Oh, I came in late. Sorry. I would have asked about that. Okay, right there. I'm wondering, we were talking about connecting to the community, and I was wondering about crossing, I think, is it Kent? I'm not sure. But if the walkway that is currently in yellow, is there some way of clearly indicating that that crosses in crosses the street yes. into um, the community so that it would, you know, I'm making it up. Let's say that walkway was painted yellow, that you would paint the same yellow in the street so that 
the community is clearly encouraged in? Yes, um, I would also say that, um, yes, and when we get to designing the buildings, we will certainly make that as inviting of a corner as possible, right, right as a grand entrance to the art and beckoning the community in. Um, this, these master plan buildings are a ways off. We're not breaking ground on them anytime soon, mm -hmm. but what we are doing right now is a exercise to re-envision th the gates that currently are their yep. yard to make them more inviting and efficient for, to, for access. And then your notion of a museum, look, I'm, uh, again, so what you're doing is great. So these are, you know, low tier questions. Right. But um, again, the no to the notion of welcoming the community, the, I'm wondering what is driving having a museum using space for a museum versus having space, community facility, community space, just for, not for rent, but for use, like for the community board right. or local groups that everyone is trying to find meeting space really hard to find, um, whether or not you'd be interested in devoting some space to that. And then um, also, if you would be willing to have more retail on the bottom for the things that are being manufactured on site. Right. So, th so, th um, so that that's yeah. Happening. So that's the concept in here on the ground floor here. And look, these okay. are these are master plans. So it may be flip flopped. It may be that somebody comes great. up with a great other way to engage the community. And of course, we would be open to that. But certainly, in terms of um, community access. When we when we come around to actually designing these buildings, that will be first and foremost in our mind. I would say on the ground floor of Building Seventy Seven, where we have um, that's a, one of the buildings that we've or, we've already completed. Um, that's the million square foot building that I was just describing. Um, we have a food manufacturing facility where the manufacturers sell retail into the lobby. So it's a kind of interesting place for the population, for the um, community to come in. It also serves lunch to our workforce, which is important. In that, we actually built a conference room, uh, okay. which will be accessible to uh, local stakeholders and Navy Yard tenants in order to um, solve a need for them, I would say, which we're certainly aware of, but also self-servingly, just, you know, we want people coming down to the yard. More, the more, more is better for us in, in terms of that. Great. And this, I'm sort of punting it back to the chair, but as part of this, is there a report that documents um, where the jobs, uh, who's getting jobs and sort of over time? You know, sort of we can different certainly. income bands, or yeah, we can um, we can we can provide um, as as much as we have on that. We have dashboards that um, you know we all look at constantly to make sure that we're on target. I will say that um, the granular data is hard for us because. Um, the State Department of Labor will not share that data with us because of privacy concerns. We're small mm -hmm. enough where you could kind of figure out, oh, that's that's this company, oh, that's that company. So we don't, we've asked, but we've not been granted access to that data. So what data we have comes from a survey we take of tenants and our employment center. So it's not, um, it's a little bit of kind of back of the envelope math, but it's the best. That's, fine. that's what footnotes are for. <laughs> it's Helen's favorite kind of math. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, back to Council Member Barron. But just before um, we do that, since we're talking about that, yeah, I, Chair Barron for Higher Education, I, I think your the whole employment center, the DOE nexus, the high school, the students, it's a model for every borough. Mm -hmm. And as a Queens guy, and I'm advocating for my Northeast Queens and everyone in Queens, I think these are opportunities that every student I think should have the ability, and I think there would be your skill set of your next generation, is even going into the boroughs, whether it's Amazon or any other major company. The, the template yeah. is there. The template is there that you don't need to go anywhere else. We have the students. So I, I just wanted to maybe give you an opportunity. You mentioned the, the 200 students and the eight, the eight high schools. Is there plans for your own independent high school or educational hub at some point that could grow within the facility, and maybe uh, we could then grow that format into the Attleboro also. Um, yeah, and I would say, you know, I think Fierstein is, when I think about our mission, the Fierstein and Steam Center is, you know, uh, it's, 
Um, it's hard for me to come up with a word. The, how I usually describe it is, you know, little angels with harps on a cloud. It's like that is everything for us. Um, the fact that CUNY students, the, Fierstein is the um, graduate film program for Brooklyn College. It is the only, um, uh, it is the only public graduate film program on a on a back lot in the country. And so those students paying CUNY rates and you know coming from the local community have better access to their chosen industry than anybody in the country, right? Um, and that is, that's extraordinary. And that's what we want with the STEAM Center. STEAM Center, actually the DOE fell in love with another building in the Navy Yard, which is a beautiful building. And they actually wanted to put the STEAM Center there, but it's a single use building, right? Like one tenant. And we actually said, no, we actually want you in building 77. We want you in the center of the center of the yard. And not many landlords would say, hey, I want 200 high school students in the lobby of our buildings and in, in, the, um, in the elevators. Um, but we, we actively wanted that in our partnership with the principal to um, create a culture of ownership with the students. And you know, Dr. Young actually said it to us in this first meeting, you, you put a high school student in a high school and they sometimes act like a kid and you put them in a place of business and they act like a young adult. That was pretty much exactly his words and we're seeing that play out all the time. Um, we're certainly, um, Oh, we we designed we built we're heavily involved in the whole concept of the of the high school and so that's a, a big chunk of work for Jocelyn and her team and on the construction side Claire and her team so we're we've got a lot going on right now but we are certainly interested in seeing that format expand and like I said we've reserved the other half of the floor in that building we're not leasing out we're not making any rent on it in the hopes that either the high school program expands or there's a similar kind of program. I'm, I'm thinking of I mean, we, we do at this point, is, especially what I do, is for the, the students and the kids. Right. So I think this is uh, a great starting point for us to reach that. Um, I'm very excited about that. It, we have students bursting through the seams, and anytime we go to a career day, we go and they ask, and the first question is, how do we get to that job we want? Yeah. And so you're providing that. And that's, that's what I think was so important. Um, and I, I thank Margaret for hanging in there from the Waterfront Alliance since you're our panel after. And I think one of the things that she wanted to ask, and since she's been waiting, was is the slides in the presentation that you have, is that accessible to the public? Can, can folks see what the future is going to be at some point? Is it going to be placed online? or um, um, it, it, A lot of this has been, uh, the renderings are online. Um, they've been in, in the press as well. So a lot, of, a lot of what is here is accessible, certainly as it relates to the master plan. So if it's not, we can get it at some point. Um, access. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're um, this presentation is very helpful. I'm sure other folks would like to. Yeah, and hear. what I would certainly say is, anybody who wants the presentation, we um, we have these conversations all the time. Exactly what would we would release to the general public is something we would just have a conversation about. Okay, and Councilman Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few follow-up questions. Um, I read somewhere about a museum. Is this a part? of what the high school will do, or is it something that's separate? No, that's, that's the concept um, on, on this next site, on the Dumbo-facing site. Um, sorry. Oh, TVs aren't on. Sorry, oh, so it's just on the, to, the separate um, plug. Yeah, it's, we're having. Um, anyway, so one of the master plan sites, we're having technical difficulties. It's on my screen, but not mm -hmm. there. Um, oh, OK. Um, this is one of the master plan sites. Um, again, the ground floor, these, these are um, goals we have, but I would call them illustrative examples of what we want to do in the master plan. There is not, it's not set in stone that we're going to have a science and technology museum <laughs> there, but what we want to figure out is a way on the ground floor to engage the community and bring them down to the yard, but in a way that's meaningful for us. We don't want to have a movie theater there, right? That would have nothing to do with our mission. Mm -hmm. So we want something that relates both to the community and and what and what we do, so um, so the science and technology museum is is just an example. You know, frankly, whether that gets built in that space or not um, will be something that we'll just have to work out in the coming years. Okay. My colleague asked the question about what percentage of the community was uh, were members of the board. And as we're talking about uh, board members, what percent of your board are black? Um, I can't do that math right off the top of my head. Okay, um, if I could get that black, yeah. and Latino, yeah. I would 
I'd like to know that because you're situated in the midst right. of what was historically always a right. black yep, community. Um, so yeah, we can get know. that. Um, we can get that for you. Um, I will say that you know, having a diversity of viewpoints and opinions is something that. Board, right, and and as serious. we talk about the gentrification that's going on at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, it's fine to say that people in the community are on the board, but I want to know right. how many blacks, mm -hmm. what percentage of blacks and Latins, Latins are on the board, and also get, talking about CUNY and SUNY, are you do you have other ideas for relationships to expand these job opportunities for students who are coming through the DOE and through the CUNY programs? Of course. As we talked about the uh, Feinstein uh, lot that's already there, the graduate program, that's a graduate program for right. film. But do you have other kinds of collaborations that you're looking to establish as well? Um, yes, uh, for sure. I mean, we um, very much want to deepen the relationship we, we have with CUNY. We already have a pretty deep relationship. So mm -hmm. with City Tech, which is right, right. down the, the road from us, right. um, we have a, a quite close relationship, really centered in large part around our internship programs right mm -hmm. now um, and making sure that those students have access to the robotics companies and, and companies like that at the yard. Um, we are in conversations right now with CUNY. I don't know where they will go. They're very exploratory um, about the next step to deepen that relationship. So we're talking about you know, graduate students, college students, high school students. How far down do you go? Because there's a school literally at where uh, Flushing and Sand meet uh, Navy Navy Yard, the right. Navy Street. Yep. There's a little high, a little elementary school there. Yep. Yep. I think it's 287. Mm -hmm. So how far down do you go in terms of uh, beginning to stimulate? Because we're talking about career days, right. beginning to stimulate children to think about that. How far down do um, your plans go? We uh, we have programs that run all the way through to elementary school. Oh, um, okay. So we do um, tours of the yard. We've actually developed cur a curriculum set. Um, which is DOE certified um, uh, to be part of their curriculum, which is free for um, free for local public schools, uh, which concentrates on um, uh, two areas. One is um, women in non-traditional work during mm -hmm. World War II is kind of a social studies mm -hmm. module. And then we have a, a science and technology module around green building design. So the teachers get trained, they take the, they take the curriculum to the school, they do a couple in class sessions, and then it culminates in a in a trip to the Navy Yard. Um, okay. Well, so we also we, volunteer um, at that school uh, specifically um, in their Read Ahead program, program. where okay. we read there um, at lunchtime as mm -hmm. well. We have a very strong relationship with that um, particular um, principal. Um, we do. She's one of my mentees. Michelle. Yeah. Is that, yes. Yeah, so she's yes. lovely. So we have a we have a strong relationship with her. Um, I hired her as a teacher for her oh. first position. Oh, so, yeah, I have she's, a special she's interest. Wonderful, yes. and the students there are amazing as well. Yes. Um, and we and we volunteer there at every level. I actually Great. go there and read. Um, we also um, work with them as far as we give them um, private tours. Um, we've had a pizza right. party for that group as well. We really Excellent. want to make sure that you know what the community that surrounds the yard knows what's going on there. We want the young people to be ambassadors for us. Mm -hmm. We want them to go home and tell their parents about it as well. And I don't know if we talked um, a lot about, we have an exhibit already in place, a small museum. Um, we have space in that building that, right. we, that we give out to DOE schools that are located around the yard Excellent. who actually have their meetings there as well. So, so yeah, um, our space, the space is already there. So the space was already, uh, yeah. So we already have, we have um, a couple of spaces in that building Even the as well. historical and we, implication of the site there. Right. There's, there's so many yeah, different ways to so incorporate. And, they, and the school Schools call us all the time, and they call us at all. You know, they call me directly. Right. So we have the principal meetings there, and the principals have a hotline directly to our. Uh, <laughs> we love that. So, yes. so it's, we have a we have a strong relationship at every level and in all right. different areas throughout our um, throughout our. And our then you spoke about the development of the three sites uh, that's coming soon. Oh, first that that okay. How tall is that structure? Um. Uh, 24 stories, as envisioned. 24. Okay, so... Is that part of the future Europe, or is that... Yes. Part? Okay. So yeah. yeah, it's going to go through Europe. Okay, yeah. so we'll be talking again about, about <laughs> um, right. my oh, colleagues no, I know I have <laughs> concerns about density. And then I read someplace in your testimony or in the briefing paper that there's also 
the uh, opportunity for special use, which means you have less parking requirements? Um, that's right. Uh, so we, that's... We've done a, um, yeah, all of this will come, you know, yeah. in the Europe and all the conversations, we've done a, a transportation study and are trying to right size the um, parking requirements so that, A, we can build the buildings and generate these jobs, but then also um, incentivize people to use public transportation. And Which is not very... Um very comfortable and very convenient there. Um, so there are a couple um, of buses that come through there. Yeah, so we Which run a, quite a my, distance. We yeah. kind of tag team at this point. We yeah. can go to my right. last set of questions yeah. on transportation. transportation. So, transportation. Yeah. The existing transportation, your future vision for transportation, mm -hmm. whether it's going to be ferry service, expanding buses, whether right. it's the BQX, whatever is happening, but we want to know what yeah, you, I mean that's that's your growth is going to require as mm -hmm. more and more mm -hmm. employees and families come. Right. Um, yeah, that's right. critically important for us. We've been making very significant investments in the last couple of years in our transportation network. Um, we built a ferry landing, and we'll be getting ferry service. Mm -hmm. um, um, we built the landing at our cost. We'll be getting ferry service in May of this year. Um, but the backbone of our transportation system is the free shuttles that we operate, which go to the F, A, and C in Dumbo, mm -hmm. and then to the um, G and Atlantic Terminal. We do mm -hmm. run two routes that kind of run continuously from 5 in oh. the morning till 10 o'clock okay. at night. So the shuttles um, are going straight from the station to the... Exactly. To the and so if you get on in the middle of the yard, you're actually six minutes away from the F, A, and C, and about nine minutes to Atlantic Terminal. And you operate so the shuttles? We operate the shuttles, yep. Yeah. Um, and so while we are, um, you know, we're not right on top of a train station by any mm -hmm. means, we are closer than most New Yorkers think, and I would put myself in that category. Right? I grew up in Brooklyn, and, then, and my dad teaches at LIU, which is like around the corner right. from us, and I was never quite sure where the Navy Yard was, to be honest. Um, and I think people think we are farther from public transportation than we are. So we're doing everything we can to dispel that myth, okay. make it easy to connect, and get people onto public transportation in that Okay, regard. so then my last question has to deal with the uh, statement that you made for the three sites that you plan to develop. You said you, you being the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation, would build, own, and operate. When you say own, who are you talking about? You, or you're talking about you as a part of the city? Um, yeah, so I, I guess I misspoke slightly. So the city owns, uh, based on the ground lease, all of the buildings, whether we build them or private developers okay. build them. The city technically owns okay. them. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very important point to bring out. So that's <laughs> kind of how we started the hearing, is to find out who's, where right. we're going from A to B. Um, is there a hope that the BQX would is that still part of a conversation with the city or on what the current status of that is? Um, so, so the BQX, the planned route, would run through the yard, um, actually entering one of our gates on the Williamsburg side and exiting through the Clinton Hill gate, effectively. Um, the corner there where the yard kind of comes up against the BQE is extremely congested and, and complicated. So I think they routed through the yard for that reason. Um, from our perspective, like I just said, links to public transportation is extraordinarily important for us. We want to get people out of cars. It's good for us. It's good for the city. It's good for the earth. Um, and so, you know, the more public transportation options um, that serve serve the Navy Yard, the more jobs we can create. And the ferry that's coming now in May, is that going to open the waterfront accessibility? Because I think you have such a great opportunity there to reconnect the community yep. with the rare waterfront. I have a district that's surrounded by water and no access. Right. right? So it's one of those things, like, we, we're tortured as New York City. We're surrounded by water, but we can't get to it. Right. So it's one of the things now that we're always focusing on for, for growth of projects is to make sure we get reaccess. Right. Um, yeah. The so um, so the ferry, sh ferry stop will be publicly accessible. Um, we will run a shuttle from the ferry stop to our to one of the gates to transport people to the edge of the yard who don't have, who aren't tenants of the yard. So we will, we're doing what we can to make it publicly accessible. So you have an existing pier already or is that being built? No, it's an existing structure. I mean, we're building the landing, but the pier exists. Well, we thank you. This is uh, the first, and I think we've been we're taking this committee to, to retackle issues in the past and now make this almost an annual update. So we look forward to working with you on that, growing how we can provide these opportunities how we can work together on bringing these to our next generation of students, our new businesses that are coming, 
um, as New York City continues to grow. This is an example of success. And I think this is, as we learn more about it, we as the council want to make sure that there is some accountability. So we know what's happening, we can get back, it's what's happening in the community, what's happening in Brooklyn, and also bring those opportunities to the five boroughs. So that's what's the purpose of today's hearing. Any other last questions, Councilman Barron? I think we're good. So thank you to the panel today. We look forward to working with you. Uh, and we just have one more panel from Waterfront Alliance. Just saw your show if you want to come up. Thank you. We appreciate thank the opportunity. You. Thank you very much. So we have Margaret Flanagan from the Waterfront Alliance. We tried to ask a couple questions for you since you waited, but come on up. Sure, you're going to come on. Thank you, Dave. Okay. All yours, Margaret. Sure, just an, introduce yourself and for the record. Thank you, Chairman. Is your microphone on? There? Thank you, thank Perfect. you, Chairman and committee members and my fellow New Yorkers. I'm Margaret Flanagan with the Waterfront Alliance and presenting feedback from our president and CEO, Roland Lewis. Waterfront Alliance is a nonprofit coalition of more than 1,000 community, recreational groups, educational institutions, businesses and other stakeholders with a mission to inspire and enable resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. We agree with the great news we've heard here today about the importance of jobs and workforce development and the great opportunities that the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, Development Corporation has brought to the property and the city. We support the new master plan and yard expansion to include public access to the water while maintaining a vibrant working waterfront. Here are some suggestions to consider along those lines. Uh, build access to touch, learn, or paddle on the water integrated into the proposed public esplanade at the Kent site. This is our uh, first obligation. Um, thanks very much to the Navy Yard for the existing uses there that include a nursery for Billion Oyster Project and access to rowing for uh, Village Community Boathouse. And those are amazing stewardship opportunities that will also stimulate, as Council Member Barron mentioned, stimulate the younger members of the community to become interested in the waterfront and the jobs there. Uh, we also suggest uh, that you cite the proposed science and engineering museum and youth STEM programs immediately on the waterfront for direct access to learning on the waterfront. Um, they're currently proposed for the, is it the Navy Yard site, where um, it's essentially landlocked from the water by the other business uses of the Navy Yard. Instead, building that kind of facility over at the Kent Avenue site, where there is public access to the water, would enable even richer learning to come come out of that center. That would also increase equity overall in Brooklyn because the um, proposed site for the museum and STEM center um, is just about a half a mile from the existing education center in Brooklyn Bridge Park. But if you go in the other direction, it's three miles before you get to another waterfront program center up at Bushwick Inlet Park. So moving that center closer to the north would really fill a gap in access to quality programming on the waterfront for the community. Uh, we'll keep going. Or we just make two of them. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> um, we appreciate uh, that this hearing delved into some of the details about the ferry access at um, the Navy Yard, which is an important public amenity. I think it's not clear to the public that that ferry dock would also include the shuttle bus ride through the restricted areas of the yard. The master plan rendering discusses a future potential flyway bridge, which would be a large infrastructure project. The distance is a quarter mile probably or so. Um, so we just advise that there be some clear, rational descriptions about what ferry service to the Navy Yard will mean. But of course, we want to continue to support that access for the great jobs and innovative manufacturing there. And we've also been joined by Council Member Donovan Richards. Hello. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, we uh, applaud 
would deeply applaud the Navy Yard for preserving the working waterfront there. Um, you know, our working waterfront sustains our high quality of life. We have access to global goods at an incredible price because of our working waterfront, and they take care of all our waste. They get our recycling done for us. And so the working waterfront is really essential to the quality of life in New York and has been really squeezed out by many of the um, real estate pressures that we see. And so we, um, sincerely congratulate the Navy Yard for continuing that working waterfront and uh, propose to keep it going. The REFI for Pier D would increase working waterfront at the Navy Yard. And we congratulate the Navy Yard for also recognizing what an incredible financial responsibility would be part of that and including um, funding for the infrastructure of Pier D in the REFI as well. Waterfront Alliance, um, sorry, <laughs> Oop, next page. Oh, and um, Waterfront Alliance also applauds the Navy Yard for their um, proposals to increase resilience and access at the Navy Yard. Um, we'd love to uh, continue supporting you with some of the tools available in our repertoire. It includes a maritime activation plan, which is like um, a menu of options for best use for integrating various opportunities at the waterfront. Um, I can provide some examples for you if you'd like to see as well. And also our wedge program for waterfront edge design guidelines, which is a, um, a specific tool that can be used for developments on the water to incorporate resilience, ecology, and access all together. So we really look forward to working with this committee and the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation to see all these great things come to life. And thank you very much. We want to see that activation plan all over the place. That sounds <laughs> very you. exciting. Thank so you. I thank you for the the additional requests. I think they make sense. Uh, you and Roland and all the hard work that you do, we, we say thank you. And um, like the Harbor School right here in New York City was an example of learning about those tools working with the waterfront. And now we're opening up a middle school in College Point to give just to show how we can grow to the Queens and Brooklyn and the Bronx some of the ideas of getting access back to the water and giving the students the realization of a future job right here. So we thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank Council you. Member Rich, oh, you left. I think yep. that concludes our hearing okay. today. Thank you, everybody. Thank Much appreciated. You.